If future generations find the grace and imagination to recover the scattered remnants of our civilization, they may well come to understand the midpoint of Wendell Berry's novel, Remembering, as the moment when that recovery began. Among Berry's shortest novels, Remembering tells the story of Andy Catlett's journey from self-pity and ingratitude to forgiveness. It tells of his homecoming. His return home began in the 1960s when he quit his upwardly mobile career as a journalist in Chicago. He and his wife, Flora, left the city and bought a dilapidated but salvageable farm in Port William, Kentucky. There, for the past dozen years or so, they have made a home for themselves and their children. But recently, Andy, Andy lost his right hand to a piece of mindless farm machinery, and with it all that his hand had known about the world. Now, shrunken into bitterness and resentment, Andy finds, his, finds himself alone in a dark hotel room in San Francisco, a stranger to himself. Waking him hours before sunrise, his restless mind leaps from memory to memory, from the farming accident that mangled his hand, to the argument with his wife the morning he left home, to the inane babbling of agricultural experts at an academic conference he had just escaped, and to his own embarrassing anger when he addressed that same audience. Unable to sleep, he walks the pre-dawn city, impelled toward, quote, the verge and immensity of the continents meeting with the sea. Reaching the end of the fishing pier that arcs out into the bay from Aquatic Park, with the voices of his ancestors in his head, Andy realizes that his home, not someplace else, but his home, is the only place that can give him wholeness. There is where redemption lies. Barry describes Andy as physically turning around and stepping away from the parapet, but much more happens at that moment and place. A history turns around in his mind, Barry writes, as if some old westward migrant who had reached the edge at last and seen the blue, uninterruptible water reaching out around the far side of the world had turned in his tracks and started eastward again. Andy's return home fits within a pattern of a succession of such returns, Barry writes. Barry has most immediately in mind the pattern of returns that runs through Andy's own family history. He frames Andy's recognition of what kind of man he is and ought to be by the stories of his grandfather's and his father's homecomings, generations of stories that Andy has heard his family tell over the years and that have become part of his own memories and inheritance. Back in 1906, Matt Feltner, Andy's maternal grandfather, returned home to Port William after two years at the State College in Lexington, Kentucky. As he was about to step off the steamboat that brought him back to Port William, an old man stopped him abruptly and be began a friendly interrogation. You been up there to that college, my boy? Yes, sir. Well, you'll be going away now, I reckon, to make something out of yourself. No, sir. I reckon not. Barry uses this old man's questions and Matt's answers to challenge two modern assumptions about education. That it is normal for children to leave their hometowns after their schooling, and that these children ought not to be content with who they are. In the next generation, Matt's future son-in-law and Andy's father, Wheeler Catlett, returned home to practice law. He graduated from college and then finished law school while working for a congressman in Washington, D.C. Destined next for a successful career in Chicago, he deliberated over his life in the city and life on the land he knew. In his mind's eye, he saw, quote, what he could be. He saw it all. A man with a law degree did not have to go to Chicago to practice. He could practice wherever in the whole nation there was a courthouse. He could practice in Hargrave. He could be with his own. Guided by a properly constrained imagination, the gift of his upbringing, Wheeler pictured himself returning to his people, 
to the place of his birth and to the way of life unique to that place. He realized, like his father before him, that a truly educated man does not have to live someplace other than home or to become somebody other than who his family and neighbors raised him to be. And so he brought what he learned at college back to his community for the good of his community. Beautifully unfolded, this intricate pattern of a succession of such returns works its way through the memory and experience of three generations, converging in Andy Catlett's life and reminding him just in time who he is. Part of that self-knowledge had come to him years before on the day he quit his job in Chicago. He was a throwback, he then realized, to that hope and dream of membership that had held together his lineage of friends and kin. The self can be truly and adequately known only in the context of other lives. In deliberate and striking contrast to the romantic hero, Andy rejects the seductive image of himself as a loose individual, ends his quest at the farthest edge of the frontier, and answers the call of fidelity to return to his marriage, to the soil that made him, and to his ancestral memory. He rejects the modern world's standard of success, and that act of resistance bears within it a sort of quiet and dignified heroism all its own. As he is about to head from his San Francisco hotel to the airport for his flight back to Kentucky, Andy realizes how much his education has been to blame for the destructive yearnings within him. Barry writes of Andy, years ago he resigned himself to living in cities, that was what his education was for, as his teachers all advised and he believed. Its purpose was to get him away from home, out of the country, to somewhere, to some place where he could live up to his abilities. He needed an education, and the purpose of an education was to take him away. While Andy's homecoming in remembering merges with the stories of Matt and Wheeler, becoming almost one, simultaneous experience with theirs, these returns also fit within a larger pattern of return in Barry's work that emerges prominently in two later novels, Jaber Crow and Hannah Coulter. During the Great Depression, Jaber decided to leave the University of Kentucky after only a semester there and make a home for himself in Port William. His decision to head back surprised him, he discovered, because, quote, not a one of my teachers had ever suggested such a possibility. His de decision never does bring him power or wealth or any of the other trappings of worldly success as the town's bachelor barber, but it did enable him to find and make a home. For Nathan Coulter from the novel Hannah Coulter, the Second World War provided its own brutal kind of education. But he, too, returned from his education to the place he knew and loved. Nathan plainly wasn't trying to make it big in the post-war world, his widow Hannah recalled years later. He wasn't going anywhere. He had come back home after the war because he wanted to. He was where he wanted to be. As I, too, was by then, he was a member of Port William. Members of Port William aren't trying to get someplace. They think they are someplace. Sadly, however, Hannah and Nathan discovered with their own children that the way of education leads away from home. The dislocations of the modern world proved too powerful for Port William's membership. That membership had been consciously sustained over generations by one act of homecoming and homemaking after another. The community did not flourish because of some wise policy emanating from Washington, D.C. It flourished because of simple acts of devotion to a place, to a people, and to a way of life. 